So I would like for Dan Gilman to just say a few words about Veterans for Peace, Chapter 92. Well, greetings, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, University Friends for hosting us, and especially uh, Louise uh, Lansbury, who really made this happen. Uh, last Monday, there was a welcoming ceremony where we had a proclamation from the mayor and other speeches. Um, but uh, this is actually the second time um, the Golden Rule it has been in Seattle, so we're welcoming them, them back. Anybody see them on their first uh, visit? Eight years ago? Okay, maybe a quarter of you. But we're really thrilled to be welcoming the mission of the Golden Rule um, for its mission of nuclear abolition and demanding that the U.S. sign the Treaty for the Pre Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, otherwise known as the Ban Treaty. Earlier this year, we had the privilege of changing our name to, to the Veterans for Peace Daniel Ellsberg Chapter 92 Seattle. There are many reasons uh, that, we, uh, that we wanted to change our name uh, to the uh, man Henry Kissinger called the most dangerous man in America. Um, two things really stand out in his life. Of course, one is the leaking of the Pentagon Papers and his whistleblowing and truth-telling that helped shorten the Vietnam War by exposing the lies of our government. We're telling the, the public and the, and the soldiers who were, who were fighting the war. The second thing um, you probably know is his life's dedication after that to ending nuclear weapons. And he is known for uh, his participating in the U.S. nuclear planning uh, in the 50s. And um, he spent many de decades revealing the government's um, nuclear policy and why it has not substantially changed uh, since the 50s. And that's all found in his monumental book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear Planner. Um, and so the, the Golden Rule is, and its mission is very special to us because of our um, taking on this name of <clears throat> Daniel Ellsberg and his commitment and passion of ending nuclear uh, weapons. And so... It's with um, great honor that we uh, honor the Golden Rule and its mission uh, for a uh, peaceful and sustainable future. Thank you. I first learned about Mike Stern when we were preparing to launch the boat back into the water in 2015. And uh, I was working on a program, kind of like we are now, only we had 400 people attending for the, you know, it took five years to rebuild the Golden Rule. And so someone says, well, we're going to play this ballad of the Phoenix and the Golden Rule as the Golden Rule launches into the water. Well, that was written by Mike Stern, and you get a chance to hear it now. <laughs> the rest of the band. I didn't know when we set sail in 58 we'd all end up in jail and I've been called worse than fool for sailing on the golden rule from San Pedro headed west on waves of a peaceful protest trimmed our sails to the wind and prayed the bomb would not be used again the golden rule the golden rule we had learned in 
Sunday school Do unto others as you Would have them do unto you Phoenix crew, about halfway through, both our ships moored in Honolulu, we agreed to do our best, and try to stop nuclear tests, neither ship did give way, but trials then kept us at bay, we made it just part way through So now the rest is up to you It's up to me It's up to you Do unto as you would have them do Do unto others as you Would have them do unto you didn't know when we set sail in 58 we'd all end up in jail and I've been called worse than fool for sailing on the phoenix and on the golden rule it's up to me it's up to you do unto as you would have them do do unto others as you would have them do unto you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, Jerry pointed out I hadn't introduced myself. I'm Helen Jacquard. You'll meet me in the movie. Um, and I've been involved with this project since February of 2015, four months before the Golden Rule launched back into the water. I had given a presentation that was originally given to me by Colonel Ann Wright. In, um, well, she gave the, uh, the presentation in 2014. And after giving it, modifying it for well over 100 times, uh, someone decided to just take my PowerPoint presentation and turn it into a film. And so in October of 2017, a filmmaker came aboard the Golden Rule during Fleet Week in San Diego. And this story, um, this film tells the story of the history of the Golden Rule and what it had done up till then very well. So I'm going to show this film to you now. <laughs> Here we are on the morning of February 3rd, 1946, on this far-off Pacific paradise over 4,000 miles from San Francisco. There are only 167 human beings here, 60 of them children. From the coconut palms, the pandanus and breadfruit trees, they get food and the material for their dwellings, of which there are only 26. They depend on their own arts and crafts. They are proudly self-sufficient. They are astonishingly intelligent. They are a gentle and lovable people. Yes, life is simple and beautiful on Bikini Atoll until today, February 3rd, 1946, when there enters into Bikini Lagoon a fateful thing, a grim, huge symbol of civilization in its most terrifying form. Arriving as Commodore Ben H. Wyatt, United States Navy, with a startling request. Will the people of Bikini abandon their paradise so that the United States can use it for a certain experiment with the fantastic, the incredible thing called the atomic bomb.
start the engine. We need to stay all unessential crew away from this. We also I'm grateful to be here. I've been the uh, skipper of this vessel uh, for a couple of months now. You know, this is a very small vessel with a big mission. Uh, the wind is calm now. What we generally get is we get that westerly flow. and it's, it's In San Diego, I'm retired, and uh, we've got a two-year-old grandson, and whenever I think of him, I think of the future that we're going to leave, and uh, I've got to be involved in this. We've got to leave a better legacy than what we've got going on right now. I got involved in peace work in 2006 at a time when I didn't even know there was such a thing as a peace movement. But I met my partner and I asked him, what do you do? And he said, I'm a peace activist. So that same year we both joined Veterans for Peace. He's a veteran. Uh, my partner Helen and I uh, have been involved with it for the last three years. We've been trying to bring this, the whole mission into fruition and uh, quite successfully. We have a huge uh, family of people who've crewed the boat and people who've organized the events and people who are supporting us in various ways. One of the five principles, founding principles of Veterans for Peace is to end the arms race and ultimately seek the elimination of nuclear weapons. This boat is an icon for that because it represents a different way of thinking about how to do protests. You know, the original folks who uh, did the protests uh, were not making any traction. So well, they came up with the idea of how can we grab public attention, and that is, let's get a sailboat, sail it from Los Angeles to Hawaii and then to the Marshall Islands, and let's cause a disruption of the nuclear testing that's going on in the Marshall Islands. August 6th, 1945, the first atomic bomb ever to be used against people was dropped on Hiroshima. And August 9th, again, on Nagasaki, a different kind of bomb was dropped. At the time, Albert Bigelow was in the Navy. He was a 30-year Navy captain. He was in Pearl Harbor at the time that these bombs were dropped. And it was so horrific to him that he quit his Navy commission a month before he could have retired with full pay out of protest of the dropping of the bombs. His family, a Quaker family, later hosted the Hiroshima Maidens who came over to New York for plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery, so that they would be in less pain and could lead a more normal life. The United States continued to develop newer, bigger, better bombs, and there were a whole series of atomic bomb tests in the Marshall Islands. They were producing elements that don't exist in nature. One of those elements is strontium-90, it acts very much like calcium and it was blowing all over the planet. And because it acts like calcium, it was getting into our baby's teeth and bones as they were growing. They were getting into mother's milk and cow's milk. And women were testing their milk for radiation before they would feed it to their children. So because of all of this and the major concern about radiation poisoning in our atmosphere, a group of Quakers decided that they wanted to do something about it. And they started the way you would normally start to try to change something. They wrote letters to the editor. They wrote op-ed pieces. They demonstrated in the streets. They wrote to the president. They tried to call their members of Congress. They did everything feasible to try to stop the nuclear bomb testing. Ultimately, they weren't successful then, and they decided they needed to escalate in their tactics. So they decided to get a boat and sail it into the testing zone and just put their lives in the way of the nuclear bomb tests. So Albert Bigelow bought the Golden Rule and sailed it out of San Pedro near Los Angeles. Really, it's a dream come true for me. It's a dream come true to be able to be a part of this movement that uh, began before I was born, and now I'm able to use what skills I've, I've obtained over the course of my years to engage in uh, resistance to the abomination of nuclear war and war in general. We want to help the public understand that there are other ways to deal with potential conflicts with other countries 
than to declare war or even threaten war or even for our country to be constantly preparing for war. We spend over half of the, the IRS income tax dollars on war. War is so nonsensical to begin with. It's just, it doesn't solve anything. It always ends up we have to be talking in the end and why not be talking in the beginning. It's just a proliferation of the military industrial complex, which is what Eisenhower warned against. It's taking all of our money away from our schools and our health care, things of great importance. Yeah, well, I think the Pacific Ocean should be living up to its name because Pacific means peaceful. So I would like for this to be the Pacific Ocean. And what's happening is that all the nuclear powers are developing their nuclear weapons, and the U.S. has recently committed itself to a trillion dollars over the next 30 years to modernize and actually create some new nuclear weapons that are smaller, more tactical, more usable. To make the possibility of a nuclear war even more thinkable is what's happening right now. They maintain that they need nuclear weapons for their whole security strategy, but you know, what kind of strategy is that? Mutually assured destruction. And the very real threat of a nuclear war between North Korea and the U.S. with uh, our uh, President Donald Trump threatening to totally destroy North Korea. Of course, North Korea promising to respond in kind. So it's a very, very dangerous situation right now. This is semaphore. This is the letter N in semaphore. This is the letter D in semaphore. So it's nuclear disarmament. And that is the, uh, the sign that evolved, the peace sign. As we sail on our voyages, we've had three years now, mostly on the West Coast, and we're always running into people who are either new people on the crew of the Golden Rule or on the sister ship, uh, Phoenix of Hiroshima. So there's a lot of history there. We run into like Quaker activists who say they went to their first demonstration when they were seven years old when their parents took them to a demonstration to free the crew of the Golden Rule. So they got to Honolulu, they resupplied, and they were headed to the Marshall Islands. Well, the Coast Guard cutter brought them back. And they ended up putting the members on trial and convicting them of a number of violations that were ultimately thrown out. So that attracted nationwide attention and worldwide attention, ultimately. During their trial in Honolulu, another boat appeared at the same dock, two slips down the Phoenix of Hiroshima, captained by Dr. Earl Reynolds, who had just spent three years studying the effects of radiation on children in Hiroshima. And they heard the story, and they attended the trial. And they were so moved by the bravery of these men that were going to put their lives in danger to stop this terrible arms race. They decided that they would take the baton, and they would go to the Marshall Islands and put their own lives in the way. And when they got into the atomic testing zone, the Coast Guard caught up with them and arrested them and sent them back to Honolulu for trial. What that protest uh, started was a worldwide uh, protest against nuclear atmospheric testing, resulted ultimately in the signing of the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963. It also spawned the uh, founding of Greenpeace and other activist organizations. Bigelow sold the boat, the Golden Roll. After the Golden Roll was sold in Honolulu, nobody heard from it for decades. And then in 2010, she was a derelict boat floating around in Humboldt Bay, and she sank in a gale. We're about to be in the air and sea show that the Navy puts on. When you bring the Navy warships and the warplanes into a city, what you're doing is normalizing war. It's a way to desensitize, especially our young people, but also the voters, to think that militarization of our country 
is a normal and okay and good and maybe even glorious thing. It blows my mind. I mean, the people aren't thinking about what this is doing to their kids. We're surrounded by machines of death and destruction, and everybody's running around like this is so cool and amazing. The government of my country is the greatest perpetrator of violence on the globe, to quote Martin Luther King. And so the air show is sort of a celebration of all that global murder and imperialism. We have to use the golden rule while we're here to show our resistance to that militarism. You know, I only wish I could do more. Now I wish I had another lifetime that I could spend, but that's not the case. So I'm going to do everything I can to resist this anti-human, environmentally destructive, and morally defective military industrial complex as it expresses itself here in San Diego in the air and sea show. The boat disappeared, but we found it in 2009 in uh, Humboldt Bay. Leroy Zerlang had his crew pull her up into his boat yard. He was going to burn her. So she faced a watery grave, then she faced a fiery grave, and then Humboldt Bay Veterans for Peace and Quakers showed up and they said, Leroy, we think we want to restore this boat. Could you give us a year in your boat yard? And we want to rebuild this boat. We went and visited the Golden Rule in 2011. And it was a wreck. We visited her again in 2013, and she was starting to take shape and look a little bit like a boat. They relaunched it June 15th, 2015. Then we took off July 20th. We stopped in 10 different ports of call. Our second seasonal voyage, 2016, we went all over the waters of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, where we were able to give 23 educational presentations. And this gives us a talking point, a point of attraction to communities that we go into to draw people in so that we can get the message that there is uh, no room, no place in the world for nuclear weapons. We're going to go dish out some peace today on the ocean. Run it up, run it up, run it up, run it up. There you go. Run it up. Pull down, pull down, pull down, pull down. They grab us when we're young, man, because they can manipulate us. The brain's not fully developed until you're 25 years old. That's why they want you when you're about 17, 16, you know. Come here, sign, on the, sign down on the dotted line, man. We're going to make a killer out of you. I joined the U.S. Marines uh, at a high school. I served about eight years. I served in Iraq for seven months as well, and that was eye-opening. Overall, like, there are good experiences. I met a lot of good people and a lot of good friends that I still have. Um, yeah. But then there's other experiences. Uh, and after a while, I just decided to, to you know, uh, get out and end my tour in the military. I was only in the military for four years, the early 50s in Korea. It took me a lifetime to realize what has happened to me because of that. And uh, I'm a very talkative guy, and I did not talk about Korea for more than 50 years. Yeah, I guess I'm not ready to, like, talk about that part. <laughs> yeah. When I flew back from Da Nang to Japan on a C-141 Air Force plane, I was flying with 200 caskets, 
that were American military people flying home, and there were about three or four of us. And uh, we sat there for eight hours with all these uh, caskets that were there. And the thing that went through my mind was the tragedy that these families would have to face. Uh, their life would be alterably changed. And uh, right then and there, I thought, I can't be a part of any of this anymore, and that I have to do something to change it. Starboard. trained as a Special Forces or Green Beret medic and uh, kept me in the States uh, long enough to have the opportunity to talk to a lot of veterans who were returning from Vietnam. These veterans uh, told me stories about atrocities that U.S. troops were committing against Vietnamese civilians in Vietnam. So that kind of sealed the deal for me. I said, there's no way I can be part of that war. I was in on the uh, illegal Cambodian invasion under President Nixon. I am a combat vet and I was a door gunner on the way out and uh, 10 months into it uh, I uh, had a moral uh, decision of uh, not carrying a weapon and not participating anymore and they uh, stripped me of my rank uh, and my medals. I was probably emotionally breaking down from a lot of the combat that I had been in. Two air crews came in, they always fly together. And they came back and they were patting everybody on the back and shaking our hands and I mean, these guys were really hyped up. And it finally came out, what happened was is one of them, they're coming back from a bombing mission and they had a 500 pound bomb left and they decided to uh, drop it on a guy on a bicycle. And the wingman who was flying behind him said it hit the guy right in the back. He said, that was the best thing. That's when I got an inkling that this really wasn't about protecting anybody. It's a shame. Uh, we got a boat coming up on your starboard. Being ashamed of myself. So, uh. And being ashamed of my country, because we're not supposed to be like this, taking each other's lives over resources and, and, uh, and objects. I think uh, we bring a unique perspective. And look, at the American people usually honor the military. Whereas other people, they may say, you know, uh, that's just some sort of peace, Nick. I don't need to listen. But when veterans who have, uh, that are members from World War II to Korea to Vietnam to the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, people will at least listen to you. They may not end up agreeing with you, but they'll at least give you the opportunity to express their view. And I think that's what makes the position unique. I'll see you there. I hope you will. Come into the meeting. We'll all be happy to see you. <laughs> okay. It feels nice to be on here. It just feels more, more in line with, you know, me and my spirit. He's 41, I'm, I'm 70, and here we are, a generation of, of veterans out here on the water, floating for sanity in an insane world. <laughs> We've been specifically sailing in support of the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which just passed uh, last month or so, 122 to 1 in the United Nations General Assembly. So it's a very exciting development. If you love this planet, you will sign this treaty. Nuclear weapon has always been immoral. Now they are also illegal. I'm really excited about the Nobel Peace Prize being given to the International Coalition to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. So what can you do? to help stop the possibility of nuclear war. What we're doing about it is through education. You can join our team. You can be an author, a speaker. You can donate. You can get involved with helping organize events and helping other people. 
Well, the original mission of the Golden Rule was to take bold action to stop nuclear bomb testing, to stop nuclear war. And so we've decided to head for the Pacific, where the action is at this time. We're planning to go to Hawaii, where the crew originally went to Honolulu, and they're also facing real uh, threat and fears of uh, nuclear war in Hawaii right now, where they've just resumed a whole statewide alarm system uh, for the event of incoming nuclear weapons. Then we're going to go on to the Marshall Islands, where the original crew was headed. The Marshall Islands continues to suffer from the results of all the nuclear bombing that was done. There's a very high cancer rate there. From there, we would head to Guam, to Okinawa, and it's from there that bombers are flying over the Korean Peninsula. Then we want to go to Japan no later than 2020, when they're going to be commemorating the 75th anniversary of the horrific U.S. nuclear bombings of the civilian populations in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If possible, we may even sail the Golden Rule right to the Korean Peninsula with our message of peace. It's time to sail this little boat across the Pacific once again to put ourselves in the way of nuclear war. The question becomes, who is going to lead the effort to eliminate nuclear weapons? Who's going to step up? Who's going to speak out? You know, hope is something, in my opinion, that comes about with the effort put forth by human beings. But hope in and of itself is uh, empty. When people are putting forth great effort, then there's hope. In 2017, we decided that we wanted to take the Golden Rule into the Pacific because President Trump and President Kim of North Korea were threatening each other's countries with nuclear war. And so, after having done 2015 down to San Diego and back, 2016 up to the Pacific Northwest, the same basic tour we're doing this year, then um, we went down... Um, down the coast of California and hung out in San Diego for a while. And I would like to point out a couple of the, of the shots that you've seen are um, when in 2017 we went up the Sacramento River into the North Mokalemni River. On the same day that the language of the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was passed, the Golden Rule sailed atop the Phoenix, which had also sank in 2010 in a separate incidence, the Golden Rule was lucky enough to have been resurrected by Veterans for Peace and Quakers and uh, wooden boat lovers. But the Phoenix was in such horrible shape that she will never be restored. So in 1958, the baton was passed from the Golden Rule to the Phoenix. And in 2017, we had a ceremony to pass the baton completely back to the Golden Rule. So when we decided that we would go out into the Pacific to stop the possibility of nuclear war, we first had to go to Hawaii, where we sailed all over the Hawaiian Islands. And our intention was to sail beyond and finally make it to the Marshall Islands. Well, this time, COVID stopped us. But we intended to go to, after Mar the Marshall Islands, Guam, Okinawa, and Japan in time for the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the bombs there. So since we were stopped by COVID, eventually we were able to get the Golden Rule back to California. And uh, the project manager that is doing the same job as me um, that just started with us in June, Michelle Marcinat, was on the boat that, that for that long 30-day trip. Um, and so then we thought, well, now what, right? Um, and some of the people that had restored the Golden Rule had this dream of sailing her all throughout the navigable waters of the United States. Well, I thought, okay, how do you do that? And I learned about the Great Loop. And even though you don't normally start the Great Loop in Minneapolis because you can't get there from the north, except maybe with a kayak, 
Uh, we have a very strong Veterans for Peace chapter there, and so we did start in Minneapolis, went down the center of the country, around the tip of Florida, visited Cuba, went way up north past Portland, Maine, to Bath, Maine, where Bath Ironworks makes nuclear-armed submarines. Um, along the way, we also stopped in Washington, D.C., and passed out a copy of the Veterans for Peace Nuclear Posture Review to every member of the House and Senate. When we were in New York City, we went to the United Nations and we were hosted by Mexico. Mexico hosted the second meeting of states parties of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and invited 13 other countries to come join us. They were delighted to be able to talk with citizen activists as opposed to people from the State Department. One of the most meaningful stops we made along the way was in Dubuque, Iowa. There's a community of 800 or 1,000 Marshallese people that live there. And they didn't know about us. But the main organizer, Art Roach, told them all about the Golden Rule and said, and by the way, they'll be here soon. So go ahead in the next one. They greeted us with song and you know, playing their ukuleles and their traditional dress. Um, it was wonderful to be able to meet them and we of course greet the Marshallese wherever we happen to encounter them and hopefully they get to hear the story of you know a little boat that was trying to do their best to stop the disaster that was happening in their islands. Um, we even got to do a little dancing with the Marshallese. Um, this is uh, one of our Veterans for Peace board members on the way to Cuba and our Cuba delegation. Another place we visited along the way was in Kings Bay, Georgia, where they have the other Trident nuclear submarine base. So last weekend we were at the one that's 25 miles from Seattle in, uh, near Paul's Bow, and, but uh, we did also visit the other one. So the one here has um, you know, enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world many, many times over, as does that one, but the one here also stores nuclear weapons, and that one just has the nuclear-armed submarines, so they don't have quite as many. I think that the one at Bangor Nuclear Submarine Base near Seattle, near Palsbo, is the one where there are, is the highest concentration of nuclear weapons in the United States. Um, and of course, we're big fans of peace parties in the park, um, and we commemorate March 1st, 1954, when the largest nuclear weapon the United States ever detonated went off and exposed all of, virtually all of the islands in the Marshall Islands and way further to radiation. And they are still suffering today as a result of that. When we were at the United Nations and met with the, the Republic of the Marshall Islands ambassador, she told us that they have, of course, a much higher cancer rate there than they do anywhere else. And she said, and there's no cancer treatment facilities on those islands. Um, she also told us that just like Native Americans here, disproportionately volunteer for service in the US military, they do there as well. And yet they have no VA clinic there with the doctors that specialize in treatment of people that have been to war. Um, this is just some of the protests that, we've, that we did along the way. We did Fleet Week there. We were hoping to do it here, but couldn't get the boat in time. Um, there's our meeting with the Republic of the Marshall Islands and with um, the uh, rest of the United Nations countries that came to visit with us at the United Nations. Um, some of the other things we've done, um, indigenous tribes often come out to welcome us. And then, of course, music is always a great thing. We'll have some more in a few minutes. And um, then 4th of July, 2022, three, um, we sailed right past the Statue of Liberty. So I thought that's a pretty cool message. Go ahead. And I wanted to show you the picture after this one. When we went through the Erie Canal to get into the Great Lakes, you can't go under those bridges with masts. So this is what the golden rule looks like without her masts when she has to carry them underneath a whole bunch of bridges that are very low. And um, so we visited Toronto and then finished our trip 
Oh, this is what she looks like when she's out of the water. I, I especially like this poster that was made up. It shows in the Great Lakes how much radiation or radioactive facilities there are, both nuclear power and nuclear weapons facilities. And I really like that cute little picture of the Golden Rule traveling all around the Great Lakes, which is what we did. We finished our trip in Chicago and then trucked the Golden Rule back to San Francisco Bay. Uh, this year we're doing a lot of the same things that we did in 2016, um, protesting against the nuclear, um, the nuclear submarine base. It's been rescheduled to September 4th. So if you want to, like, sail on the Golden Rule or get out there in a kayak or just be on shore to watch the show and have a picnic there, um, go to our website, vfpgoldenrule.org, and you can get all the information that you need. There's what we did in 2016. That's the Bangor nuclear submarine base in the, ba in the background. And day sails, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anybody recognize that woman on the right? Yep, that's Colonel Ann, Colonel Ann Wright. Quit her uh, job with the State Department in 2003 at a protest at the start of the Iraq War. And we are definitely a weapon of mass education. So wherever we go, we talk about the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and what you can do to stop the possibility of nuclear war. So we do keep track of bills before Congress that would do things like um, take away the president's sole authority to launch a nuclear weapon, get rid of the ICBMs, which are uh, first strike weapons because everybody knows where they are, so they can't be used as a second strike, they'll be taken out. So as a way to declare the, a no first strike policy, the ICBMs have to go. So the Golden Rule sailed in 1958 to stop nuclear weapons testing, and they managed to help get atmospheric nuclear weapons test banned. In fact, most of nuclear weapons testing was banned. Underground testing was still going on, and the Golden Rule directly inspired Greenpeace when two couples were sitting at a table and talking about what can we do about underground testing up in Alaska, and they decided to get a boat and sail up there just like the Golden Rule. That was Greenpeace. In 2017, 18, 19, we thought that the Golden Rule was going to visit, you know, Guam, Okinawa, Japan, and possibly other countries over in Asia. And one man in particular had been protesting against the Jeju Island naval base that was being built at the time. And when he found out that we would not be able to visit Korea and Jeju Island, he got a boat and decided to sail it for peace. It's called Jonah's Whale. I just wanted to introduce to you Sheik Cho, who is one of the crew members of that maiden voyage. They sailed 107 days, uh, 3,000 miles from Korea, Jeju Island, Okinawa, and Japan, um, no, Taiwan, excuse me, on a peace mission. And they stopped at a lot of different places along the way, especially a lot of places in, uh, in uh, Japan. Oki well, they, they visited Okinawa and lots of places in Japan. So... Um, I would like to thank them for their mission. I hope that someday we can bring a Golden Rule crew member to sail on Jonah's Whale, just as Sheik Cho has come to the United States to sail on the Golden Rule. I'd like to give um, Jerry Condon a chance to talk about the possibility of nuclear war now, especially with the war going on in Ukraine. And uh, would you please say a few words, Jerry? Yeah, so today is... The 79th anniversary of the horrific atomic bombing of Nagasaki. And people talk a lot more about Hiroshima. Of course, there's a lot being written this week about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I was on antiwar.com last night looking around. And uh, antiwar.com is a very good source for alternative information about issues of war and peace. 
And there were several really interesting articles there. One of them about, by Greg Mitchell um, about Nagasaki, called Nagasaki, the Forgotten Bomb. And I want to read some of that to you because it's, I found it quite interesting. We've heard, why did they drop a second bomb? We often hear that as well as because they, it was a different type of bomb and they wanted to see how it went. I think that's plausible and, and, and probably true, but there was more to it than that. And it says, Greg Mitchell writes, In truth, the man behind the Nagasaki bomb was not President Truman, but General Leslie R. Groves, who was the director of the Manhattan Project. Earlier, he had fiercely promoted using the first bomb and stifled attempts by scientists to convince Truman otherwise. Truman never explicitly endorsed the notion of a necessary one-two punch. It was Groves, General Groves, who was the true believer and catalyst. As soon as Hiroshima was bombed, he pushed for the second mission as soon as possible, just as authority for the next attack had devolved to him from Truman, who was on a ship in the Atlantic returning from Potsdam. Groves himself would later boast, I didn't have to the pre- I didn't have to have the president press the button on this affair. The second bomb run was originally set for around August 11th, and if adhered to, this would have come a full day after Japan's initial surrender offer. But bad weather was forecast, so Groves pushed the mission up two days, even knowing the conditions might not be any better. And they would have to rush preparations for the, on the island of Tinian from where the bombing took place. Tinian's an island in the Pacific. Another problem, the pilots had been ordered to only release the weapon when the target could be seen visually, not just by radar. As it turned out, stormy conditions remained in the forecast for August 9th. The lead plane took off anyway, and despite a faulty fuel pump, then he found the primary target was Kokura, the Japanese town of Kokura, was covered by clouds. So he pushed on to Nagasaki, despite dwindling fuel. Then the crew found that city of Nagasaki was also shrouded in clouds. When a small gap in the overcast was spotted, or so that was claimed by the bombardier, the payload was released, off target, but still lethal. All of this was set up by Grove's determination for what he called a knockout blow. He would explain that once you get your opponent reeling, you keep him reeling and never let him recover. Then Groves had the nerve to claim in his memoir, he wrote a memoir called Now It Can Be Told, and he he said he was considerably relieved to learn the Nagasaki bomb had landed off target, meaning a smaller number of casualties than we had expected, something like 100,000. Um, But when reports of deaths from radiation disease in Japan emerged in the weeks after the bombings, he called that a hoax or propaganda. Then he said, um, maybe there's a difference between Japanese blood and others. And he claimed that he had been told by doctors that radiation sickness is a very pleasant way to die. I think some would uh, argue with that. So... um, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, some of the Golden Rule crew were over last weekend. We got to be here for the week, one of the weekends where they have major gatherings at the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolence, Nonviolent Action. Many of you have no doubt been there and, and know a lot about it. But it's um, you know right next door to the Trident Submarine Base. And it's kind of a um, disconcerting, I mean, because the, 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 the space itself is beautiful. They've built, they've built a beautiful meeting space and home. There's a pagoda under construction. There's all these big, lovely trees. There's these little bunny rabbits running around the yard. But then the back fence is this menacing-looking barbed wire fence right up against the Trident submarine base. There's eight Trident submarines there, with uh, each one of wh- each one of which has uh, the firepower of over 100 Hiroshima bombs. 
Uh, so that puts a target on, that's the, actually the largest concentration of deployed nuclear weapons in the United States. So that puts a target on, that's just 25 miles, 20, 25 miles west of here, so it puts a target on the whole region. If, if there is a serious nuclear war that breaks out, this will be a major, major target. Uh, and yet, uh, what, from what I hear, uh, most people in the region don't even know it's here, which is, which is uh, strange. Um, so Ground Zero has been working to overcome that. They, they've, run, they've had bus ads talking about ground, all the web, nuclear weapons that are that close to Seattle. Now they're doing billboards in strategic locations. And they, um, of course, they have regular ongoing civil disobedience and protest actions at the base, specifically on Martin Luther King weekend, on, on uh, Mother's Day, and on Hiroshima and Nagasaki week, as well as other times during the year. So we were uh, there and got to participate in the, the action last Monday. And then 12 people, including one member, at least one member of Veterans for Peace who came all the way from San Diego, were arrested uh, for blocking the roadway. And it's done in a very, you know, choreographed way. They've done it before the local police are very gentle and they kind of give people citations for have to appear in court later on, but they kind of catch and release. But anyway, we were, we were very proud and humbled to be there and to be part of that on, ongoing effort, especially at a time like now where we are facing a greater risk of nuclear war than even during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, for one thing, we have this terrible... U.S.-backed genocide, Israeli genocide taking place in Gaza. And now, um, and the U.S. is providing political cover and a steady supply of 500-pound, 1,000-pound, 2,000-pound bombs to be dropped on children in Gaza, as they've just done that again in the last few days, bombing schools where refugees were sheltering, killed quite a few children. They've killed over 40,000 uh, people, and that's just the conservative numbers. Uh, it's going to be a lot worse than that. And they're starving people <laughs> to death as well, not letting food and medical aid uh, to get into the area. And now, on top of that, um, uh, the Israeli leaders, particularly Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, seem to be trying to uh, uh, foment a region-wide war in the Middle East and to drag the United States into that war. Uh, so it's a, that's a very dangerous situation, and we have to keep in mind that although it's never been officially acknowledged uh, by Israel or the U.S., everybody knows that Israel has nuclear weapons. And uh, we've seen the behavior of the apartheid state of Israel. Um, it's not hard to imagine that they would use those nuclear weapons. So that's a very big threat right there, and that comes on top of several other threats because we have the ongoing war in Ukraine where the U.S. and, and Russia are facing off. Both of those are the primary nuclear powers. That could still all too easily go nuclear if it's not de-escalated and ended. But the U.S. keeps on pouring more and more weapons into that war and, and blocking negotiations for peace. In the meantime, some of the same neocons that are have captured U.S. foreign policy are planning for a war against China, another nuclear power. Um, so we have a lot of serious threats before us, and um, um, it seems like there's, feels oftentimes like there's no adults in the room, uh, especially in the Oval Office. Um, and uh, Biden has been getting a lot of bad advice, and of course he's kind of locked into the Cold War warrior mentality uh, so this is a very chilling time. I think uh, if we're serious about wanting to ward off the threat of nuclear war, then we have to end these wars that could trigger a nuclear war. Uh, we have to call for an end to U.S. weapons going to Ukraine and to Israel. Um, and we have to call for no war with Iran, no war with China. Um, and um, I'm glad to say that Veterans for Peace is 
stepping up to the plate, a lot of chapters around the country. You know, we have over 100 chapters around the country, so in some ways we're small. The chapters tend to be small, uh, but we're everywhere. And uh, we are t- taking action. We actually have our uh, national convention coming up next weekend, uh, the 16th through the 18th. And the theme of that is demilitarize, decolonize. And there's going to be a major focus on Gaza as well as on nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, you're, uh, that's uh, online. You know, we, ever since COVID hit, we've been having our conven- national conventions uh, online. So you're all actually welcome to participate. You can go to vfpconvention.org and sign on. There's a little bit of a donation requested, but not absolutely required. And so that's next weekend. Uh, and you can go to vfpconvention.org and see the whole program of speakers and workshops and whatnot. Uh, we're also planning for action the first week of September. Um, the September week of action and solidarity with the Palestinian people. It's a Veterans for Peace initiative uh, where we'll be uh, targeting weapons manufacturers around the country who are profiting uh, from the slaughter in Gaza. And uh, so September is actually going to be a, a, a real month of resistance because there's also a global week of action uh, for against spending on nuclear weapons. It's been called for by the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, and that's going to be um, on September 16th to 22nd. Um, and a lot of people will be protesting, including direct action at uh, weapons manufacturers, uh, nuclear weapons manufacturers in particular. And then that's going to be followed immediately the last week of September by another global week of action, this one targeting energy corporations that are responsible and profiting off of the other existential crisis, the climate catastrophe. So there's a lot of uh, action going on. These things are kind of uh, overlapping. Veterans for Peace members are going to be participating in all of them. These are connections that we uh, see all these struggles are connected, and, and so should our movement be and our resistance be connected uh, so it's really important that we do all we can to end the wars and to push for a peaceful U.S. foreign policy, one, re- one that respects the sovereignty of all nations, the human rights of all people. It's uh, time to abolish nuclear weapons and also to abolish war once and for all. Thank you very much.